Uh, hi, everybody uh, on Champion Land. I want to introduce you to Jeff uh, Winkleman, and Jeff is a solution architect for Red Hat. And I asked Jeff a question about uh, Azure Stack and how um, Red Hat uh, OpenShift was playing in that environment. And he was kind enough to jump up at the board here and to start drawing. And then I thought it was uh, pertinent enough that you know we could do a quick video about Kevin Vogel involved, and we'll send it out to everybody and 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 do this brief overview so you get it right from the horse's mouth rather than us transposing Red Hat's position on this. But Jeff was, he's fairly new to Red Hat and he went through a new type of sales training program that uses a little different uh, type of concept where they really do use case or as he called it problem based selling. So you ask customers questions about problems and then you give them your generic capability and that could be a second meeting. So you're not digging into specifics immediately and then as it's further qualified, you get the engineers involved and they really dig in and they provide a complete solution. So with that, Jeff, uh, thanks and I want to turn it over to you to do your okay. hybrid cloud overview model. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks for having me. All right, so <clears throat> when asked the question about Azure Stack, what you're generically talking about is hybrid cloud. So let's define hybrid cloud just real quickly so we're all on the same page. So when you're talking hybrid cloud, what you're basically talking about is two clouds. The public cloud, everybody's heard AWS and all of the messaging that everything's going to move to the public cloud, right? And then there's those that believe that the private or on-prem cloud still has a place. And hybrid is enterprises or customers utilizing both. And really, if we knew this answer, we could all go make a bunch of money. But the real, the bet is, what's the mix going to be? And the reality of it is, is the mix is really going to depend on the customer. There's going to be, there are some already. Netflix, as an example, runs completely in AWS, right? Or you're going to have other customers that don't, for a variety of reasons, don't want their data in the public cloud. So they're going to keep their data protected in the private cloud. And maybe they use the public cloud for certain workloads or whatever, right? And so the game is, what's the mix going to be in? And in my opinion, the mix is going to be different per customer. Okay. So when you start looking at solutions to address this, obviously from an AWS perspective, they're purely a public cloud play right now. But other entrants to try to gain traction, such as Microsoft, they're competing with Azure in the public cloud space. They're starting to introduce Azure Stack as a way to try to address this market around hybrid cloud. Okay. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to walk you guys into what the stacks look like and then how Red Hat solutions fit into the stacks, okay? And what I mean by the stack is if you drew a cloud stack, or as simple as you can, you're basically going to have your hardware on the bottom, right? Compute, storage, networking, whatever, okay? And then generally speaking, you're going to have a layer that's typically referred to when you're talking cloud terminology, <coughs> infrastructure as a service, okay? Then you're going to have some type of layer on top of that, platform as a service, and then your apps run on top of that. Okay? So that's your generic stack, and this exists in AWS, it exists, um, when you're saying it exists in theirs, AWS is an example, and Azure, this is by default what a public cloud is, is infrastructure as a service. And then AWS has been putting a lot of investment into providing some type of PaaS layer so that your customers that are using AWS are purely focused on their apps. That's it. They don't care about anything else down below. Um, now, from a Microsoft perspective, they're here with Azure, and Azure Stack is purely a IAS play, but they're partnering or s supporting other pieces to try to create a PaaS layer. So if you go look at their marketing doc, you know, marketing stuff, they're going to talk about using things like Cloud Foundry and you know some of the other generic kind of PaaS solutions that have been out there, right? And supporting Python and PHP. When you start writing these things down, what you're going to see is a lot of their messaging is very much not about Windows. It's about Linux. These are all Linux technologies. And that's because open source is where all the momentum is, right? So 
you look at the, I mean, so much development is moving to using open source technologies, and open source is, <laughs> you know, lately really, you know, always been, you know, based around Linux. So the technology stack that is utilized in these PaaS layers and app layers is heavily Linux oriented. Okay, so when you start talking about the layers now, doesn't matter who's providing the public and the private cloud. You start looking from a Red Hat perspective. If you go on-prem, okay, we can provide an infrastructure as a service solution, right? Whether it be via OpenStack or more of a just a virtualization platform competitor to VMware, okay? And as you go up the layer to the PaaS, OpenShift, okay? Now I'm gonna draw this here because OpenStack and virtualization is purely a non-prem thing, right? You're not really going to run those in your public cloud, right? But private on-prem, you can add some storage here as well, both in the form of Ceph and Gluster, as our infrastructure-oriented solutions, okay? Then the PaaS layer is OpenShift. At the app level, we've got all of our JBoss technology, right? Again, both stacks focused. And then you can add to that our management portfolio, which is environment agnostic in that sense, right? Cloud forms, Ansible, satellite. The reason I'm drawing it this way is to just start putting these in buckets, right? This cluster of stuff is focused towards a private on-prem thing and realistically competes directly with Azure Stack, okay? But from a Red Hat perspective, it's all about enabling portability of the applications that our customers are writing. And the enablement is through OpenShift JBoss, the management solution. I should have wrote them in a different color because then they would stand out. The pieces of the portfolio that play to the hybrid cloud story are these four. Gluster, OpenShift, JBoss, and our management stuff, okay? Where I'm going with this is when you start talking about whether your customers are interested in Azure Stack or building a private cloud using other technology, that's half of the conversation that's really about these pieces, private on-prem. That's all you're talking about. Once you go above here from a Red Hat portfolio perspective, we don't care if you're running in Azure, you know, AWS, Google Cloud, or VMware, or our own stack from an IaaS perspective. Now, we can get into real details about advantages of one versus the other and all of those, but just generically speaking, from a high, very generic high-level architecture perspective, <clears throat> half of, you know, we feel we've got a really good story about enabling our customers, whether container-based, to make portable workloads between the hybrid architecture and enable that customer to decide on their own where do they put their money, right? Do they, do they build a bigger private cloud and a smaller or vice versa, whatever works for them. The key messaging is around giving them flexibility, not lock, getting locked into one versus the other, right? You get... You know, one of the challenges with AWS is it's a, they've got all of these awesome services that you can, can write your apps against. But what happens is if, you're, if your bill gets to the point where you can't really afford to run there anymore, but you're so tied like a, you know, roots of a tree into AWS, and you, no way you're going to move it. So you need to build, you know, the way we coach our customers is to build their technology stack off of portable technologies, things that can move and give them flexibility to run in a, either a mixture of public clouds or a mixture of public and private and realize that hybrid model. Well, down the road, don't they want to be able to move from cloud to cloud as economics makes sense, right? Yeah. So if right now AWS is cheaper, I'll run it there, but next, let's, let's be honest, I just saw AWS lowered their price, which means that next week Azure is going to lower their price. You know, it's just yeah. it's a it's always that war. So the portability so, piece, right? So if you if you if you take a strategy where you're going to invest in technologies that enable that portability, then that 
leaves that door open for you. Well, and then microservices is really what takes the place of a lot of what AWS is doing, right? When you start building your own microservices around containers. It, so it just depends, right? When you look at the, if you're going to take a microservice-based approach to the architecture for your app, it's basically just a collection of services, and each service, the, the word micro is meant that that service does, typically does one, one thing, thing, and it doesn't really work, right. right? So you could use some AWS services for that, and then write your own. And it's always just a trade-off from a time-to-market perspective, from an engineering investment perspective. What do you, do from you portability, read? too, because you start tying right. yourself so, too much. So when you, when you start looking at what services does AWS provide, are there other ways to consume those same services without necessarily having to write them yourself? Right. right? And that's, that's where the, this PaaS layer really starts to come into play. But isn't there a lot of open source microservices that are being developed now yeah. that are portable, right, across platforms? Right. right. Absolutely. So I can understand the portability that PaaS brings to the application environment, and that's really what this is all about. Yeah, really, the, what the PaaS layer is doing is making your apps not care where they're running, and what the PaaS platform does is it abstracts away the infrastructure. Right, so my management is generic regardless of the infrastructure that it's associated yep. with. When you get down to it then, even if, so Microsoft's play is they're saying with Azure Stack versus Azure, we're going to make the, the infrastructure as a service look the same. Mm -hmm. And they're arguing that there's benefits to that, okay? I've done this in my career, so as I started out telling you guys I'm new to this role, I was the infrastructure as a service guy. I was the guy driving all the automation around it, and in my opinion, the automation that you need to plug into this layer, particularly if you're using something like Ansible, is a fraction of what you're worrying about. So if there were, if I, if I was talking to a customer and they were concerned about the investment they would have to make to automate towards two different infrastructures as a service, this isn't their problem, right? And I would argue that there's other discussions to be had about building the optimal infrastructure. If you're if you're building a private cloud, what's the most optimal way to do that? What's the best technology? To well, I think that what up? they're trying to do is simplify that for the people that don't have your skill set. So there, therein lies that it's a, that's a great point, which is every customer is going to have a different staff, a different set of skill sets, and are they really going to be interested in retooling their teams or not? Right. And so when you get down to it. That's that's where the well that's where Microsoft made their money. That's why Novell's no longer around. Is Microsoft made it easy? Well, right. They made the point and click, and that's what they're trying to do with. But here's the with infrastructure. So right. But here's the. This is why I made the point of talking about all of their technology stack that they talk about the PaaS layer. It's all Linux based. It's all Linux based technology. But you're already so, on stack. I'm talking right. about the IIS. I'm talking about that layer. They're trying to make that simple, and so, that's what they're doing. So also from a support standpoint, if it's more generic, you know, with reference-based architecture, then, you know, support could potentially be easier. Maybe you could mention the storage. There's a couple uh, new pieces of nomenclature there that mm -hmm. I'm not quite aware of. Can you explain to us what they stand for and what they do from a feature set standpoint? Yeah, so real, very simply, without getting into the... And, of course, okay. as we move on and they become more feature-rich, the lines blur even more. But generically speaking, so I use two terms. One's called Gluster, and you can think of this mostly as a distributed file system. Okay, That's primarily where it was originally targeted. Ceph was originally targeted as being a block storage solution. Then it picked up object storage. <laughs> Gluster can do um, object as well. It so one's an NFS. Up. The other one's a traditional storage It's, it's NFS with... Fault tolerance, to, you know, a, a whole bunch of enterprise class features to it, right? So you can, but generically speaking, you can think of it like it's NFS. Right, still right? network based. Whereas Ceph originally didn't have a file based interface to it. We're adding that as we speak. Um, but this really grew up originally around OpenStack, right, as being a uh, software defined storage, so both of these fall into an SDS category, software defined storage category. The significance of using software defined storage is, is your customers can run this on any hardware vendor you guys are selling IBM, HP, Cisco, it doesn't matter. 
right? They can go to, if they want to, some white box vendor out of Taiwan that's making, you know, they can use commodity hardware. Well, that's why clouds are going to this, yeah. because they, they can these, buy that cheap stuff. Both of these scale horizontally. They scale very incrementally, so they can just add a node at a time if they want to, and scale out their storage, and they both scale to massive uh, storage. So how do you dovetail that back into the portability that apps have? Because so Ceph is definitely targeted primarily towards infrastructure as a service, okay? Now, Gluster, the best way to describe how Gluster plays, we've got customers using it for multiple use cases. An example, an easy example would be, a uh, cable service provider using it for their VOD storage, for video on demand media mm -hmm. storage. Okay, that's not this use case, right? Where Gluster plays comes into containers. So let's switch gears a little bit. Let's talk about containers for a second. So containers really is are not a new technology. Container technology has been built baked into the Linux kernel for a decade plus. Okay. And, but most simply, you can think of containers as just a packaging concept, uh, a zip file, if you will. Okay? But when you execute a container in Linux, it basically, uh, to the code running inside the container, it thinks it's all by itself. So there's some isolation characteristics around executing the container. Okay? But the, the real benefit to, to the packaging thing is its portability. And I don't mean portability across the operating systems because the reality of it is if I take a container that I built on top of RHEL and try to run it on Ubuntu, doesn't, there's no guarantee it's going to work. Okay? So it's not portability from a, oh, you know, abstracting away the operating system. It's just portability by ease. I got one file, I can move it around. It's smaller than a VM image, but it's bigger than individual libraries and files that you have to manage, okay? So this is heavily beneficial around configuration management. But it does come down to the kernel level. Even in Red Hat, it has to be for a specific kernel. Yes. Well... Because the instruction so set is different for the different kernels as they get enhanced, right? Yes. Yeah. Um, now... <clears throat> That's true, but at the same time, um, there is portability around if the file systems look different between one kernel version versus another, you could run a 7.1 container on a 7.3 Linux kernel. Right? Yeah, there's we, there's maybe capabilities maybe to do Maybe for the sake of this discussion, we can keep we it a little can, bit higher. Yeah. So it's mostly a packaging thing. allows you, And when you start moving towards a microservice-based architecture, you end up with a lot of these containers. Okay? So... You've got containers all over the place. And what's happened is in, a, in our cloud world, you don't have a single computer running a single workload anymore. Your app is distributed across a cluster of machines, right? So your cloud is made up of all these computers, you know, one to N. And then you're on top of it, you've got all these containers running, okay? And Containers make it easy to get your app, to, you know, deployed and manage it and that sort of thing. But once you start getting to a huge number of them, now it becomes a management challenge, and that's where OpenShift comes in. So OpenShift is not the container, you know, runtime. That's Docker. Okay. OpenShift is basically Kubernetes, which came from Google. And all it really is is we call it an orchestration engine, but what it basically does is it just helps you manage these containers at scale, right? So when you say management uh, of the containers at scale, does that include the integration of Gluster, which I would think stands for global clustering? Sort of, okay. So I was walking into why Gluster is relevant here. So now that we understand what OpenShift is basically doing, it's orchestrating a lot of containers for you. And it's things like if my container fails, it'll re automatically relaunch the container. Okay? If I've got a little group of containers that really need to be deployed together, it'll manage those together. Right? It just it's a management container management uh, solution. You also scale them as they need as more people are hitting the app. Yeah, there's, scale di there's different scaling things you can do with it. Um, it's got really a lot of real nice features for dealing with containers at scale. Okay? Now one of the things, though, that's unique about containers is when you run a container, 
And if you started writing files and whatnot inside that container, any data that you create, if the container dies, the data disappears. So where Gluster comes in is that now, across my cluster of hardware, I can have one or more distributed volumes, storage volumes, that my containers can read and write from. And so whether that container is running on node 1 or node 17, it can get access to the same data, writing and reading, and it's basically a permanent storage solution for containers. It's not its only use case, but that's where it's being used. So if I data. move a container that includes an application from an on-prem to a remote public cloud, if Gluster will make sure that it has access to the data. And so that's the a great question. Um, I'm not sure. So we definitely can use Gluster in AWS, and we can definitely use Gluster in um, in private. I'm not. I'd have to look <coughs> into uh, what you know from a syncing standpoint. How does it move the data between the two? Because I know the, the the key here is going to be more not so much capability. Because I know, for example, um, DreamWorks uses Gluster for their media, for their, you know, movies that they work on. And they have teams that work on it in two parts of the planet, West Coast and somewhere in Asia. And so they're sharing the same media files across a, a distributed cluster setup. So they're not locking the file in one location? They're actually both accessing the same file at the same time? Not at the same time because they're working at different time zones. Oh, okay. Right. But so they are locking the file while they're using it. And a, I'm not sure if they're locking it or not. If that, cause To me, locking the file from a read, that's more of an app problem. It's not so much a cluster problem. But there's locking a file and then there's locking a database. Those are two different things. So right. I could see where it, potentially you can have replication at the file level. Right. I'd like to learn more about the, the database replication because that's the rocket science there. So there's replication aspects to this, and the only thing about private versus public is how fat is your pipe, right? That would be more money. Well, and how much are they charging for storage over there, too, right? I mean, yep. the, that's going to affect. Well, well, my point is, is that if I relocate an app or if I have a failover policy, right, to move an app into a public cloud if my on-prem goes away, if there's no data there, then yeah, it's just, it's just Well, maybe that's where OpenShift comes in, and I don't know this, but if you say, I want to move it from here to here, and it's orchestrating it, and say, okay, well, make sure you take that data that they're accessing with it, right? I mean, It's going to depend on the architecture of the app and whether they're using a relational database or a non-relational database and how that data gets distributed across their... Their multi data because really what you're talking about in that scenario is a multi data center setup, right? It's just one of your two data centers is public cloud instead of your own, right? And so how does it? How does your data get replicated in a in a multi data center? Yeah. See, I'm thinking that Azure is going to have some advantages because of some of the Microsoft tools with replicating SQL, you know, always on and and things like that. And that, there's opportunities for us because we're a data management company. So, uh, well, I mean, you know, Oracle's got a lot of that same stuff. Most databases have replication. You can also, there's different ways to replicate the data, whether you're replicating it at the app level or app PaaS level, or you're replicating it more at the infrastructure level. Right. You can approach it multiple ways. So where I was trying to walk into is when we start talking about Azure Stack, okay, as it relates to Red Hat, you're just talking about, let me use a different code. You're just only, in our, you know, ignore all this noise for a moment and just focus on my two stacks I drew. Azure Stack is this. That's it. So if you have a customer, whether they're, and I realize your relationship with Microsoft, right, but if you had a customer that had an interest in AWS, there's still a way Red Hat can help them realize a hybrid strategy. Oh, sure. Right? Because in that scenario, it's just this, and you know, then you got to talk about this a little bit, but it's mostly this. Now, with with um, Azure Stack, okay, infrastructure as a service, there's also a standardization of tools associated with the management thereof. So that means that the same tools that I have uh, I'm managing my environment in Azure, I also use those same tools managing the stack on-prem. Right, right, so 
Yeah, but we're, I mean, those are some generic ways. So when you talk in management, what are you managing? Okay, so for example, if you look at their technology stack, one of the pieces lifted is Chef. Well, what's Chef? It's a configuration management tool, right? There's nothing special about Azure Stack and running Chef. I can run Chef anywhere. I can run Ansible anywhere, right? So I don't know if that's just some marketing things they're saying around Azure Stack. If there's other management that's more focused around this piece, then okay. I mean, but then again, we could you can do management of your infrastructure of a service with Ansible too. Mm -hmm. You um, got you got to remember that Microsoft is a lot easier than Linux. It just is. And that's what Azure Stack is giving these people, is the much simpler interface, much simpler way. And I'm not saying that the big enterprises are going to use Azure Stack. I guarantee you the smaller people with lower skill sets are looking for something simple that gives them what they need without having to go through, oh, now i got to learn Chef. Oh, i got to learn Gluster. Oh, i got to, I'm just, that's what, well, that's what Azure point. Stack is giving them. It's a good point, but then when you start, you also need to talk about those smaller people, what workloads are they running? Did they develop those workloads themselves? What technology are they using for those workloads? And what I mean by that is if they're, if they're using a, a Linux technology stack for their workloads, then that Microsoft advantage doesn't apply there, okay. right? But if they're running Microsoft workloads on Microsoft Windows, well, the, the, what percentage? In the, the only the, the only thing in our portfolio that's Windows is Ansible. Let's right? look at SMB. Right. Let's look at SMB, not the big enterprises. Yeah. What percentage do you think of their workload runs on open source? Yeah, very little. Very little. Yeah. So I'm in SMB where a lot of it runs in the platform that they're that they're talking about. So they have those skills already. That's all I'm saying is it, it that's well, you why wonder I mean we're getting a little maybe a little philosophical, but then you start wondering how much for those SMBs are they looking at software as a service as a replacement to running yeah, that's as what, much as they that's, can. That's mm -hmm. what we talked about before we talked about the different um, uh, private uh, workload model. Okay, one being, you know, so much web services that uh, potentially all can go to public. And then what's left on prem is that multi tier database oriented application model. And then we broke that down into multiple categories. One category is, is it canned? In other words, are they buying it for an ISV? Because they're going to get a lot of pressure to move it into, into an ISV oriented cloud. Mm -hmm. And then there's two other types, and that's workloads that or maybe develop proprietary in-house, but don't have very much, if any, ongoing um, uh, application development. And then the third is one that has ongoing application development. So it is kind of a convoluted model. It puts a little bit more pressure on sales to understand where something fits. And that's why I wanted to have this. And uh, you know, thank you very much for taking the time and doing that. I think it's going to be very helpful. I'm going to send it out to our guys, and this will be the first of many, hopefully. Yeah, absolutely. Okay? Yeah. Thanks.